I want to welcome everyone to the Virtual Mark Twain Library. I'm Elaine Sanders, the library's adult programming coordinator, and I am delighted to be here with you tonight um, and to welcome our speaker, Bex Caswell Olson. She is the Director of Book Conservation at Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover, Massachusetts. Bex will be speaking to us about professional book conservation, and then she's going to give us a few tips about what we can do to conserve our own personal collections. Bex holds a Master's of Sci Library Science with a focus in preservation management from Simmons University and is a graduate of the bookbinding program at North Bennett Street School. Over her 16 year career, Bex has worked in the conservation labs at Harvard University, MIT, Iowa State University, and Michigan State University. She is also a conservator in private practice, and she is currently the president of the Guild of Book Workers and a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation. So we are delighted to have her with us. And she was actually recently here at the Mark Twain Library to um, evaluate our collection, our Mark Twain collection. So it's good to have her back. And before I hand the evening over to Bex, please know that she's going to be taking questions at the end of the program. So feel free to put them in the chat at any time. And you can find that feature down at the toolbar on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So now I'm going to turn things over to Bex. Thank you, Bex, for being with us. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so I thought we could start tonight off with a virtual tour of NEDCC, and I'll highlight some of our recent projects along the way, and then I can tell you a little bit more about how to care for your own collections at home. So let's see. A little bit slow to change slides here, sorry. There we go. So a little bit about NEDCC um, or also Northeast Document Conservation Center, NEDCC for short. We are a nonprofit organization that provides conservation and preservation services to clients really across the nation. Although it, it, when we were founded in 1973, our intent was just to serve the New England area. Um, we were the first independent conservation lab that is to say not affiliated with an institution that specialized in the preservation of paper and film-based collections. And today we're the largest independent conservation center in the country. And we have since expanded our services to include education, outreach, and digitization. So we have five departments in total, and I will tell you a little bit about each one of those. So the first department is preservation services, and this department is really primarily responsible for providing our preservation education, outreach, consulting services, and they oversee our publications. This department really does a lot, so I'll just kind of give you a, a, an overview of everything that they do. So really core to our mission as a nonprofit is education, and to that end, we offer a wide variety of training options opportunities that are geared towards libraries, archives, museums, but also private collectors. Many of these programs are offered at affordable rates thanks to grant funding. And um, another fantastic thing is that if you are a certified archivist, you can earn professional development credits or archival recertification credits through the Academy of Cer Certified Archivists for a lot of our, our programs, both in person and online. So when it's possible to do so, we have a, a we do hold in-person workshops on things like disaster planning, emergency preparedness, um, framing and photograph preservation. But more recently, we, we have really been focused on our virtual training programs, and we have both live and recorded on-demand sessions, as well as um, some self-paced online instruction. The, the course that's been around the longest is Preservation 101, and that's the one that most people know, but we also have some courses on AV preservation and photograph preservation. And once a year, and sometimes twice a year, we will do an in-person conference, although this year it was virtual. Um, and we'll be doing that again in November. It's called Digital Directions. Um, and I would encourage you to check out our, our training calendar online. There's a lot of really great things happening. So another thing that our preservation service department handles is assessments and consultation. And so we have a variety of different assessment types that we offer. 
um, kind of to suit various needs. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, and I would encourage you to check out our website if that's something of interest to you. But all of the assessments would result in uh, a site visit and a written report. And it could give you advice on a wide variety of topics. If one of our structured assessments does not meet an institution's needs, we can basically tailor a consultation to whatever something, a topic of, of particular interest of surrounding preservation. So that might be um, exhibit practices or planning for a renovation and move, planning for new storage space, something like that. We can really, really tailor it directly to you. We also have a number of free resources on our website that I would also definitely say, please go take a look at. The ones I wanna to highlight today are preservation leaflets. And this is a really great series. It used to be a print publication, but now it's all online. Um, and these are technical leaflets, but they're written kind of with a general audience in mind so that on things like, again, emergency planning, um, temperature, environmental controls, how to safely exhibit your collections, how to protect things from light damage, et cetera. The other thing I'll, I'll mention quickly, and I'll share a link to it in a little bit, is there's a page specifically on caring for private and family collections that I think is a really, really useful page to know about. And last but not least, um, we offer expert advice and, and mainly that comes in the form of, we have essentially like a preservation reference service. So if anyone has a question, they can call or email us and that service is supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We do also have a 24 seven emergency help hotline. And so if your institution or your personal collection is struck by disaster, a flood, a leak, a fire, and you don't know what to do, you can call us any time of day or night. And while we don't provide disaster response services, we can put you in touch with someone who does and kind of walk you through what your, your first steps are. So that was preservation services. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our audio preservation department. So our audio preservation department was established in 2014. So it is our, it is our newest department. And we provide preservation reformatting or digitization for preservation for a variety of different audio formats, only some of which I have listed here. And we really specialize in formats that are either rare or obsolete and thus require special equipment or materials that are too damaged or too fragile to be played using traditional methods. And so maybe you're saying, well, if you can't play it using a traditional method, how on earth are you gonna digitize it? Great question. We are so incredibly lucky to have the IRENE Lab. And now IRENE is an acronym, not a person, and it stands for Image Reconstruct Erase Noise, Etc. And this is a machine, and we actually have two now, that was developed by a physicist at UC Berkeley in conjunction with NEDCC. And essentially what it does is it uses a confocal microscope to take an image of a piece of grooved media and then from that image file, we can correct that file and turn that into an audio file, which is pretty amazing, I think. Um, so in this example shown here, here's a broken lacquer disc. Lacquer discs, they look a lot like LPs, but they're a little different and they are very brittle. And when they break, obviously, you're not gonna be able to play that with a stylus. So it would a disc that's broken like this would give you an image like that wavy line you can see those grooves are no longer lined up so that we have some software that helps with tracking, but it's not perfect. And so a person does need to go and manually adjust to realign that, and then we can create that audio file. And here's just another example. This is a delaminating lacquer disc, and this is a very unfortunate and common problem with lacquer discs. And obviously that's something that you would not be able to play with a stylus. And so this is really the only way we can get audio off of that type of media when it's in this condition. So that's kind of the long and the short of Irene. If you wanted, if you had more tech, technical questions, I would direct you to our director of audio preservation. That's definitely not my area of expertise. Um, but in addition to Irene, we do have two tape labs, although we do things besides tapes. And this is where we primarily do magnetic media, but some other stylus transfers that can be done with a stylus. Um, and all of our audio services are one-to-one -one fully attended transfers. And so what that means is that one audio technician is digitizing one tape or one 
piece of media at a time and they're listening to it fully in real time while they're doing it. And so this is Carl here and he's at his workstation. And the advantage of doing this is, you know, again, we're specializing in things that are fragile. Maybe they can only be played once before they're too deteriorated to play again. So you want to make sure that you're getting the best possible sound file from that transfer if this is your one and only chance. So by having someone listen and monitor, monitor for problems, you can be sure that that transfer is 100% faithful and accurate. And here's just another view of Carl's workstation with some of his different equipment for tapes and um, stylus and computer. Uh, again, if you had more specific questions, I would have you talk to somebody in the audio department. Um, so in addition to audio, we have imaging services for a, a wide variety of materials, more traditional imaging services, I'll say. Um, we have had offered reformatting services since the 1970s. And back then we were doing photographic reproductions or putting things on microfilm. But in 2008, we switched over to a totally digital setup. And again, we're focusing on, on safe digitization of things that are fragile, rare, historically significant. Maybe um, you know a lot of places do have the ability to digitize in-house, but maybe this is too much material for them to do in a reasonable time frame or things that are really large and difficult to handle and have special needs. And so this item here is a great example of that. This, uh, we have David and Caitlin here, and they're working on imaging a map that is stored rolled. It's almost 27 feet long. And I'll show another picture of this a little bit later. Um, but obviously that has some very special handling needs and needs to be imaged in a, in, you know, in a certain way in order to get a good continuous image of that. So a lot of times when people think of digitization, they think about scanners, but what we do is really photography. So all of our digital imaging is done with overhead photography rather than a scanner. And we do that for a couple of reasons, mainly because that means we can image a wide variety of materials. Um, we can get really good quality images and because we can do that in a way that is really safe for the object. So nobody is trying to smush a rare fragile book on a scanner. Um, so this is one of our workstations. We've got David here again on the right, and um, and he's showing off a little bit how he's how he's going to image a bound volume without needing to take it apart. Um, our workstations use 100 megapixel cameras, and I think we're about to upgrade to 150 megapixel. Just for a little bit of context, the newest iPhone has, I think, a 12 megapixel camera. So this is really many, many, many times that quality. All of our imaging is done to FADGI specifications and FADGI stands for Federal Agencies Digital Guidelines Initiative and it's really the national standard for digital imaging. So we can do a, a wide range of things in our imaging department, as I mentioned, things like printed books. So this lovely little book uh, on flowers was part of a three-year project we did with the Chicago Botanic Garden to digitize their language of flowers collection. Another project made possible through an NEH grant, and that is all now av available freely online. Um, we can do illuminated manuscripts in these really beautiful bindings and sometimes, you know, beautiful fragile pages. Things like scrapbooks and photo albums that again have some special handling needs. You never know what you're going to find when you turn the page in a scrapbook. Um, record books, things with lots of attachments, photo albums, um, photographic prints, and oversized materials. So here's David again um, working at our XY table where we do oversized materials. And it's hard to tell in this photo, but that XY table is on a track and it moves on both an X and a Y axis. And so if we do have something that's too large to fit in a single frame, we can move the table rather than moving the object. And that way you're gonna get a really consistent set of images that you can stitch together and you're not handling the item, which may be very fragile. Um, this, is, this poster that he's working on was for a project that we did jointly with the Boston Public Library and the Museum of Fine Arts um, for a poster exhibition that they did together. And there's a really nice story on our website that you can go 
check out that talks more about the conservation and the digital imaging, if that's of interest to you. Um, and we also have some special workstations where we can image film and negatives, including nitrate and acetate film, both of which have some very special handling and concerns. Um, nitrate, for instance, requires cold storage, so we actually store that in freezers when it's on site. Um, otherwise, there is always the risk that it can spontaneously combust. Um, and then acetate, when it's deteriorating, it, smell, it gets something called vinegar syndrome, and it has a very, very strong vinegar smell. It's not particularly good for you, so you do need to take some health and safety precautions when you're working on that. Um, I don't believe most other places that do digital imaging are not willing, not set up and or willing to take those materials, but we, we are capable of doing that. And then the last thing that our imaging department does is facsimile printing. So we can create very high quality color accurate prints that you can use um, in exhibition in the classroom as a teaching tool. We have uh, printed and bound entire books to be used as surrogates if the, fragile, the original is too fragile. And what David and Caitlin are working on here is actually printing reproduction of historic wallpaper. And this is a project that we recently did for Jekyll Island. And again, there's a really nice two-piece story on our website that, it, that you should go if you're interested. Please check that out and read some more. Um, but we flew down there and removed this wallpaper. It was actually mounted on the ceiling of a historic home. Um, it was not in very good shape. And so the majority of it was rolled and put away into an archival storage facility. But a section of it did come back to NEDPC, get some treatment and was digitally imaged. And then we had to do some digital restoration because it had faded and, and you know, it had darkened from soot damage and just the ravages of time to do some digital restoration to restore the colors to what they would have been when it was hung new. We then on our large format printer uh, have special printable wallpaper that we can print on and then we're able to print enough to and have that all shipped down to them where it was rehung in the home. And it looks absolutely fabulous. And we've done that a for a couple of different historic homes and that's a really, really fun project. Um, and that's also a great example of how our imaging department works really closely with our conservation departments. So now let's move over and talk a little bit more about our book and paper conservation labs. So book and paper conservation, we share a lot of space and even some staff, but we are both managed separately and do have uh, each of our departments have employees with specialized training in those fields. So first, let's talk a little bit about the paper lab. So NEDCC as a whole occupies about 20,000 square feet in a, an old mill building. And the book and paper labs together, because they are kind of one large space, are maybe about a third of that. So we have a pretty significant amount of space, uh, which is really fabulous. And that means that we just have plenty of space and equipment to be able to do the work that we need and we can work on large numbers of things and oversized materials easily. This is a kind of 180 degree view of the paper and photo and a little bit of book lab in the back there. Um, and it was really designed to be nice and open and be flexible to, to, to meet our needs for whatever projects might come through the door. Some of the specialized equipment that we have that again is shared between book and paper. Um, up in the top left there, we have Suzanne working in a fume hood. And so she is doing that right now. Uh, that's something we might do if we were working with solvents, which obviously you don't want to be breathing or if we were working with things that were moldy. Uh, the bottom left is our custom light bleaching unit that was custom built for us. This is kind of like a tanning bed for paper, and so it, it is very helpful it's for getting out certain kinds of staining. And then on the right, we have a computerized mat cutter. We also offer framing services, and with that computerized mat cutter allows us to cut either multiple mats that are exactly the same and really consistent, but we can also cut circles or shapes. Uh, we have floating around a mat that's cut in the shape of a brontosaurus. So you can do really do anything, things that you would not be able to cut very easily by hand, which is fabulous. 
So here's that that almost 27 foot long, it's 26 and a half feet, sorry, railroad map that I mentioned earlier. And here is our, our paper lab is working collaboratively on it. When you're working on something this big, you do really need multiple hands in there. Um, and all of our tables, they're height adjustable and they are on wheels. And so we're able to kind of literally reconfigure the space and line those tables up end to end in order to accommodate working on something like this. Um, so we treat a really wide variety of things in the paper lab, including beside, you know, really large maps. This is a, a, a more contemporary print and hand-drawn collage by John Baldessari, which also was framed. And just in case you're wondering, like, how on earth do we get something this big in and out of the building, we do have a really nice we, we are in an old mill building and it has a really nice large freight elevator, but we do have to measure and plan accordingly because every once in a while there's something that it's like, oh, sorry, that's not going to fit unless you take it out of the frame. Um, so besides doing some large things like this, we can do really small things like photographs and we have right now one photograph conservator and she dedicates all of her time to photograph conservation and this is a nice before and after of a, of a piece that was very badly damaged. Again, really big things are kind of our specialty. Um, and in this, this slide, Katie is working on treating this large wall map that is backed with linen, which is very common for wall maps. And it had originally been on some wood stretchers. It, at some point in its life was shellacked, which again, a very common thing for these wall maps, but that shellac had really darkened and turned brown and cracked and really made the map essentially illegible. And so Katie there is working in one of our really large sinks and we have two, two sinks this size and a couple that are maybe about half that size. Um, and I, she's got this map propped up on an angle at the moment. It's just been washed and the water is draining off. So the photo underneath that, you can see all that gunk and discoloration that's coming out of that map while it's in the bath. And it's quite a lot. And then on the right, we've got, um, the map after treatment, it's been relined with a new linen backing and it has new wood stretchers on it. It's ready to hang. It's much, much brighter, much more legible. And that's really the goal. So not everything is huge, I promise. Um, you know, some of the other things that we do, we do a lot of work on are blueprints and other architectural drawings. A lot of times these get rolled up and stored away and then they get damaged as a result of that. And so this is a blueprint that came in it was humidified, flattened, and mended. Um, blueprints and other architectural drawings do tend to be light sensitive. They also tend to be on very thin, fragile paper, and they're also pH sensitive. So they need just a little bit more and different care than other paper objects. Um, here's a globe that we treated. And so globes, you, you know, it's not a flat paper, but the surface is paper. The, the, the globe itself is like a wood and paper mache core and then has the map adhered on top. And again, this is one that had been shellacked, had darkened, had cracked, and it also had some insect damage and all of that was, was treated. And then something that's not a paper or a photograph, but that we treat in the paper lab nonetheless is parchment or vellum. Um, so there are lots of historic documents like this indenture that were written on parchment and then they're folded up usually pretty tightly. Parchment, when you fold it, it does not like to be unfolded. It likes to stay that way. Those creases are very, very deep. Um, and it did not lay flat. This particular item also has, you can see there's some uh, wax seals kind of hanging off the bottom. And this is something that the museum that owns it wanted to be able to frame it and hang it for exhibition. And it is on exhibition right now, I believe. Um, and so those seals being heavy were a concern. So this was flattened, cleaned a little bit. There wasn't too much that could be done in that area. And it's on now, um, it's, it's in, a, in a sealed frame. I'm trying to figure out how to explain this, but, um, Basically, it's, it's sort of stitched, although not through the parchment itself, but it's got something attached to the back that then is stitched to help keep it flat under tension so that it stays flat. And it also is supporting those wax seals so that they're not going to, the weight is not going to damage it while it's on display. And we're working on a story about this right now, and it should be going up any day now. 
Um, and then last but not least, the paper lab does offer framing services. And this is Anna Jean, our preparator, showing off some of her work. So when things come to us for treatment, um, it is possible for us to have them framed and returned ready to go on display, whether that's in a museum or in someone's home. Um, so here's a kind of parting shot of the paper lab and you can see um, we have this nice long wall of windows that are north facing. Uh, it's, it's, it's very pleasant to get some daylight and we're up on the fourth floor. And so, uh, well, one great thing is we can see the highway very clearly. So, you know, oh gosh, I better leave now. Traffic's gonna be terrible. But, but it's also, we get to see some really nice sunsets and just having natural light is really useful. And the, the, the book conservation lab is kind of the back towards the left. So let's walk over to the book lab and this is really my domain. And so here is the book lab. I'll, I'll admit this picture does not look as fancy and glossy as the paper lab, even though it really is, I promise you the same room. And that's partly my photo skills. Um, and partly because I wanted to take a not staged picture, but this is a real life picture in, on a day when everyone's there and working and it does get kind of mess, messy. Um, and I can tell that this was taken in the last year. So one, because everybody's wearing masks and two, there's a partition up in front of two people that face each other normally. Um, and that's not usually there. Um, so I have uh, six people in the book lab two part-time and the rest full-time people um, doing book conservation, which is really fabulous. So over in the book lab, we really treat anything bound or that was, was once bound. And that includes things like scrapbooks, which again, you never know what you're gonna find. I've seen uh, pieces of cake that were smushed in between the pages, I, coins, keys. I mean, you name it, people have glued it or taped it into a scrapbook. Um, illuminated manuscripts, herbarium. Herbarium are really, really fun and really interesting. In this one down in the bottom there, um, it's being swabbed, it's getting tested for arsenic. Arsenic and other things like mercuric chloride were typically used as biocides. And they, but they can in fact be hazardous to your health. Those, those things are no longer used. Um, and this one, there were, there were some, some things about it that kind of set enough of an alarm for us. So we tested it for the presence of arsenic. It did test positive. And so that informed our treatment plan. And it also meant that we worked with it in the fume hood wearing gloves and a mask. Um, we also work on photo albums in conjunction with our photo conservator, um, printed books. And I'd say we probably see fewer printed materials these days because institutions are really wanting to focus on unique materials that don't exist elsewhere or in other formats, but there are still plenty of nice printed books out there that come our way. And of course we do record books and all sorts of manuscript material. Just to name a few. Um, I never know exactly what, what I'm gonna get to see at work, which is really fun. So while I don't have time to go into a ton of detail, I just wanted to quickly show you some before and after shots of some projects that we've recently worked on. So for us, the goal of conservation is to improve the usability or long-term stability of an item while maintaining as much of the original as possible. This, this image here is of a record book from the 1600s, which had been rebound at some point in the 19th century. This book was really heavily handled and over time, the binding had broken, some of the pages had fallen out, and they got really damaged, really torn and tattered as a result of not being attached to the binding. And so when we treated this book, we ended up taking the whole thing apart, washed all of the pages to help remove some discoloration and acidity in the paper, and also treated the inks with, it's called calcium phytate, helps stabilize those manuscript inks. So you can see a big color difference between the photo on the left and the right. It really did remove a lot of that yellow. Um, and then everything was mended and rebound into a new binding. The pages are now very stable and they're not gonna be damaged during use anymore. And that's really the absolute goal for us. Um, if everything I described to you is kind of a mystery and you wanna know more, uh, earlier this year, we made a video with Insider Magazine that really shows this process from start to finish. It's about 10 minutes long and you get to hear me talk over it a little more. 
Um, and you can probably find that on our, certainly on YouTube, if you look for how an 1850s record book is conserved or something like that, you will definitely find it. And I'm sure it's on our website as well at nedcc.org slash videos. So next, next, next one. Oh, this is really, was a really fun project for me. Um, so this is a book from the 1500s. It is a printed book. And at some point in its life in the 19th century, it was rebound into a, a hardcover vellum binding, which was a, a really typical binding of that time period. Later in the 20th century, someone repaired it because the cover and the spine had fallen off. And the repair wasn't really done that well. It's hard to tell in this photo, but you know the cover is definitely a little bit bowed. That front cover is actually no longer attached. Just, it's just sitting there. And you might notice that the spine is like really dirty and kind of wrinkly and crinkly looking. And that's because whoever did the repair just put on way too much glue. It was really hard and really wrinkly. And the book just did not open properly anymore as a result. Um, the, this is owned by a university who uses this book to teach a history of the book class. And while they're primarily looking at the printing and the printing history, having a binding that was actually appropriate to the book and the time period in which it was made mattered to them. And so that's what they tasked us with doing. Um, we don't know exactly what the original binding would have been because there was no evidence of that anymore. It had been removed completely. But we do have other examples from that time period that have survived and from that part of the world. And this happened to have been printed in Italy. Um, and so I was able to do some research and find some examples and share those with the client. Um, and this is what we decided on was a kind of simple wood board binding with just leather over the spine and some simple blind tooling. So, you know, today when we're making books, we're using, it's called binders board and it's essentially a really, really dense cardboard. Of course, they didn't have cardboard in the 1500s. They were using wood um, and leaving the front kind of uncovered like that to save because leather was, materials were very, very expensive was a very common practice. Um, so I think this came out very nicely. We, we purchased some quarter sawn oak um, and I think it just came out really, really great. And I believe they were happy with it. So instead of trying to make something look new, we were trying to make it look old and that was kind of fun. Uh, this is another really great project. This is a Victorian hair album. So the owner of this book collected locks of hair that belonged to their friends and loved ones and you know, stitch those together with some ribbon and attach those ribbons to the pages. Uh, and throughout this book also were interspersed some, poet some poetry about friendship and love, et cetera. So while the idea of like taking locks of hair from your friends and family members might seem kind of creepy to us now, this is a really common thing in the Victorian era. Um, but it, this did not stand up so well over time. So the sil silk does not typically um, it, it is not a lasting material, sadly. It becomes really brittle. The ribbons had broken, the locks of hair were all loose and kind of scattered, and they had become really like damaged and kind of frizzy as a result um, and disassociated with their captions. Um, so Mary worked on this and there's a textile conservator who's right down the road from us in Andover who gave us some advice and, and some supplies. And we used a, a technique that's commonly used in textile conservation where we stitched the locks of hair to a very fine netting and then cut away so you can't see the netting. It's really basically invisible and, and it was done with something called hair silk that, that really just blends in and you really cannot see it at all from the front, it's fabulous. Um, and then the ribbons were mended and things were reattached where possible. I think there's at least one piece that could not be reattached. Um, so this was a really fascinating story. There's lots more to it. Also trying to figure out based on stain patterns where the different locks of hair went. And again, this is one, there's a really nice story on our website um, that I would definitely encourage you to go, go check out if you wanna learn more. So while all of that might sound really fun and interesting and glamorous, I would have to say not all of our work is so glamorous, but a lot of it can be really messy and gross. There's a surprising amount of uh, you know, crawling around in library basements, vacuuming mold and bugs and uh, doing other things like tape removal, which is definitely not glamorous, is very tedious and using strong solvents and it's not terribly fun. 
So in this photo, Katie and Jess are actually working on moving, removing cellulose acetate lamination, uh, which was something that was popular up really through the 60s. And they have to do that in a pretty strong solvent bath that is definitely not something that you want to be breathing. So they're doing that not only in the fume hood, but wearing half face respirators. So everyone at NADCC every year is fit tested for a respirator. And then we all also undergo chemical hygiene and chemical safety training every single year. Uh, so not always glamorous, but definitely necessary. So now that I've given you some info about how we care for your collections, let me give you a little bit of information about how you can care for your own collections at home. So I had mentioned earlier, I was going to share a link with you on our website about uh, caring for private and family collections. And so that's up at the top there. And that's probably going to say everything I'm going to say, but maybe a little slower. Um, and so please, please take a look at that. When it comes to caring for your collections, I think the very best thing that you can do is to store it in a good environment. So I'm going to say location, location, location. Please avoid you know, keeping materials that are of value to you, whether that's monetary value or, or personal value, in places like your attic, your basement, your garage, your crawl space. And the reason for that is those, those areas of our homes tend not to have heating or air conditioning and that they are more likely to be places that will get wet if it's raining, if you have a storm, if there's a flood or a leak and your materials will be damaged as a result. Temperature and humidity, that great big fluctuations. It's not great for paper, but it's really, really pretty much certain death for things like photographs and audiovisual material. The best environment is around 70 degrees, preferably less and less than 55% humidity. You can have a little bit of fluctuation. You just don't want it to be 70 degrees one day and 40 degrees the next day, kind of like regular New England weather. Um, and so, you know, again, those attics, garages, crawl spaces do tend to be more damp, more humid, and dampness can lead to a variety of problems besides just water damage, including things like foxing. So foxing appears as these like rusty colored, brown, rusty colored spots in paper. It's a lot of times it is confused with mold, but it's not mold. And the way you can tell is mold will be on the paper, whereas foxing is really going to be in the paper is the best way I could describe that. Um, it is very disfiguring. And for the most part, it's not reversible. There are potential, with the caveat that potentially there are things that you can do for works of art on paper, like I, the, the light bleaching station that I showed. Um, but to do that for an entire book would just be so cost prohibitive and time consuming that it's absolutely totally impractical. Uh, mold, of course, is a big problem in, in, these, in a damp area like your basement. Um, and mold is, it, it can leave stains that are permanent. Those really cannot be removed. And the other thing, when mold is growing, it produces enzymes that actually digest paper, leather, cloth, really any organic material that it's growing on, it will digest as it grows um, and just can be incredibly damaging. I do not have time to go into a lot of depth about how to salvage wet or moldy materials, but so I have a whole lot of links on this page for you that you can find. They're most our preservation leaflets, section three on emergency management has a couple of different resources related to this. And then I we do also have a YouTube video, again, if you're not sick of my voice yet, where I will walk you step by, by step through how to vacuum a moldy book. So another problem with garages and attics and basements is that they are more prone to things like insect damage. Those are all places that insects like to hang out. And there are a number of insects that will eat books. This particular book, I believe, was eaten by some kind of wood boring beetle. He was long gone by the time I saw it, so I'll never know for sure. But things like cockroaches, silverfish, book lice, and also um, case-making clothes moths love the cl cloth in hardcover books. Um, and again, all these bugs have the same one thing in common. They like dark, damp spaces like your basement or your attic or your garage. And so if you can avoid storing materials there, you go a long way to preventing pest damage. The other thing I would recommend for just things that are in your regular living space is regular dusting and vacuuming is also going to go a long way to keep insect populations down. 
Uh, bugs especially really love dust. They think it's a really nice cozy nesting material. And so if you get rid of dust, they'll be less interested. The other thing I would say about if you are storing things inside your home, um, that to think about light damage and what sort of light exposure things are getting. Light damage is both cumulative and irreversible. And it can not only cause fading and discoloration, but it can cause paper and cloth to become brittle. So this, this is a two volume set. And the book on the right had been stored inside a box and the one on the left was out on the shelf being exposed to light. And I think you can see a pretty significant color difference between the two. And they were you know, right next to each other. Um, so if you do have things that are getting direct, you know, uh, you don't want direct sunlight. And for things that maybe you have framed hanging in your home, it's not a bad idea to think about rotating those periodically. You know, give, give some of your artwork or your photographs a rest and share something else, just, just like museums do it. And speaking of having things out on display or framed items, um, I would say not all frames are created equal. Uh, for things of value, you want to make sure you have a good quality frame with good quality materials that are permanent and durable. So the Library of Congress has a great guide on matting and framing for a collection for preservation that will go into this in greater detail. And that's where this image comes from, and explain all the parts of a frame. If you go to a frame shop and you ask for conservation framing or museum framing, they should know what you're talking about, I hope. Um, and I would really recommend doing that for things of, of value. And so, you, so that would mean using, for instance, an acid-free mat uh, and definitely having a mat or a spacer or some kind of some kind between your piece and the glass. You never want to frame anything touching the glass because it can't, especially photographs can get stuck. And I've definitely had that experience and there's really not much you can do once that happens, unfortunately. Um, the other thing I would recommend is if it is something of value and it is going to get more light exposure to really strongly consider a glass or a plexiglass with U a UV protective coating. And the best is museum glass. So there are different levels of, of UV coating and really the best is museum glass and museum glass has a good UV coating and it's also clear, you know, it has a lot of clarity, it's clear. It is probably more like about three times more expensive than regular clear glass. Um, but my personal opinion, which you don't have to take, is that if it's something of value to you or something that you want to be able to pass on to the next generation, it's worth that cost. Just my opinion. Um, so when it comes to handling of materials, a question that I hear a lot is, do I need to wear gloves? And I might shock a bunch of people tonight when I tell you for most things, the answer is no. That wearing gloves actually makes it harder to feel what you're doing. And so you, especially when it comes to handling books and paper, you're more likely to cause accidental damage wearing gloves that is, is worse than any oils in your hands. So really the key for most books and paper is to have clean, dry hands. Wash your hands with soap and water. Hand sanitizer does leave behind a residue. So soap and water is always best and just make sure they're dry. And that's really the best thing that you can do. The only time I would recommend wearing gloves is if you are handling photographs or negatives because your fingerprints can uh, leave oil behind that will attract dirt and dust and that's very hard to clean. When you are choosing gloves, those white cotton gloves that are the stereotype, if you have those, that's fine, but by no means you need to go out and buy those. They do make it really hard to feel. They, they're kind of toothy and they do pick up a, and transfer a lot of dirt. Um, and so instead the conservation community really recommends using either nitrile or even vinyl gloves, which are a cheap alternative. They are single use, but they're also easy to buy at the hardware store or, so, or some, somewhere like that. Um, when it comes to cleaning books and documents, and this is definitely something in the last year I've, I've answered lots of questions on, um, please don't use any liquid commercial cleaning products on, on, on books and paper. Please, please, please. Definitely very damaging. For things like heavy dust and dirt, you can use um, a vacuum cleaner with a soft brush attachment and maybe even a cheesecloth or a screen if you're worried about um, damaging some fragile materials. Um, 
but there are also some other dry cleaning methods that are really useful. Um, the, in the top image, we have a vulcanized rubber soot sponge, and this is kind of my absolute go-to. These are sold for cleaning soot off the wall. So if you're like me and you've made, you have a fireplace and you forgot to open the flume once, um, and you know what happens to your wall. This is what that's be sold for. It does a great job and it also does a great job of removing dirt from books and paper. And it's something that you, even though it has sponge in the name, you use it dry. Uh, cosmetic sponges also work great for removing dirt. They're also nice and gentle. Um, and a, or a soft brush is also very effective. What about when you need to repair a book? What kind of tape you sh should you use? The answer is none. <laughs> Please, anything that you want to keep forever, please don't use tape on. Um, if it's something that you're just trying to get another one or two uses out of, or your kid's favorite book that you know they're going to be over next year, tape is fine. But for something that you want to keep forever, please don't. I know that there are tapes out there that market themselves as archival, and I really just cannot say enough. There is no such thing as archival tape. Um, Tape can be really damaging and it does turn, it does become discolored and cause stains. In this picture on the left here, that tape is actually on the other side of the page that you cannot see. That stain has come all the way through and stained both of those pages. Um, in the right, it's really kind of oozed and it's actually made the ink bleed where the adhesive of the tape has gone, um, which is really unfortunate. Tape is really hard to remove without causing damage, even for a, a very skilled conservator. And just, just trust me, it's not your friends. <laughs> um, so if you do have a document or a recipe or something like that, that, that has torn and you want to keep it, what should you do instead? Um, so I would recommend putting things in, in polyester sleeves or even a plastic sheet protector, as long as you're using the right kind of sheet protector, which I'll tell you about in a second. So you can, uh, polyester sleeves, uh, a lot of archives, library suppliers sell these, and sometimes people know them as Mylar sleeves. Mylar is actually a brand name, and the material itself is polyester. And this is a stable plastic. It does not yellow, and it does not become brittle over time. When you're looking for sheet protectors, and you can buy those at an office supply store, you just want to make sure that you're getting a good quality one that is made either out of polypropylene or polyethylene. And those are those nice soft sheet protector plastics or like plastic baggy plastics. Don't buy the cheap ones that are made out of vinyl or PVC. I would avoid those at all costs. Those do off gas, they will degrade your materials, they will turn yellow, they will get brittle and yucky. And then I would say, you know, uh, do it yourself repairs. Very rarely a good idea, especially if it's something of value. Um, in that case, I would recommend looking for, you know, finding a professional conservator. And there are a lot of fantastic people around. Um, we do have a preservation leaflet called Choosing and Working with a Conservator that just tells you a little bit about what you want to look for when you're shopping around for a conservator and what the process of working with them is like. And then the American Institute for Conservation has a find a conservator tool that has um, only list conservators who are professional associates of their organization. Um, who, and to become a professional associate, you ha basically have to submit a portfolio and be vetted by your peers. So someone that you know is reputable, in other words. So that was a lot of information and I'm very happy to take some questions at this point and I've got contact information up on the screen and you're very welcome to call or email us if you think of something at a, at a later date also. Thanks. Thank you so much. This was a fascinating tour um, of your facilities and what you can do. I know we have lots of book lovers in our audience tonight, many of them who are our um, wonderful book fair volunteers. And they've been um, sending many good words of thanks for your program this evening. Um, we do have a few questions and um, wanting to know, is there, can book storage ever be too dry? That is a great question. So yes, actually, um, if it's too dry, that can dry your materials out and make them brittle. But when we're talking about too dry, we're talking about for sustained periods of time. Um, and, you know, 
typically we would say maybe 35% um, humidity is kind of the bottom, but I know that in New England in the winter, that's very, 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 very difficult to achieve but unless you're humidifying your space. To have it properly. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone, we have so many people tonight, if you please put your questions in our chat function, that would be I do. helpful. Pardon me? That would be helpful, thank you. Sorry, Bex, did I? No, it's okay. And we also, um, somebody would like to know Michelle. about your guidance in regards to board art covers and broad art broad art covers um, broad art is I, I like broad art as a company they have two different kinds of book jacket covers and there's one that is marketed as archival and yes I do like that one the other one I, I don't know what the material is and so um, I never like anything if I don't know what it's made out of understand thank you um, any suggestions to remove odors from books Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. I actually have one more slide in here, if I can bring it up, because I had a feeling that was a question I would get asked because it is something I get asked a lot. Um, so for musty smells, one, book, books and paper will absorb the smells around them. And so if it's been stored somewhere musty, it will smell musty. So the first thing is get it out of the musty area and somewhere that has some good airflow to air out. Um, the next thing is that you can put that item in a box with some odor absorbing material. And there's all sorts of different products out there. This Nature's Miracle charcoal filters, those are actually you buy those at the pet store and they're to go in a cat litter box. Um, and the air sponge is something you can get at a hardware store. In both cases, you don't want that odor absorbing material to come in contact with your item. You just want it to be in the box with it. Um, and you can kind of put the lid on, set it and forget it for a couple of days or weeks while that odor absorber is doing its thing. If you check on it and it's still smelly and the odor absorber, you pull, pull that filter out and it really smells musty, throw that out, put a new one in and repeat. This is something that does take patience. It does not happen overnight. It, it is a process, but it is very effective if you can be patient. Thank you, great tip. Um, also, how can you remove photos from acidic albums and how to keep the photos from cupping? That is a good question. Um, so those mylar or, or polyester sheet protect sleeve that I mentioned earlier, those are great. To those are more rigid, the polyester. And so those are great to keep, protect your photos from handling, from fingerprints, and it will also help keep them flat. But paper does have a memory. So once something has curled, it is very hard to get it to stay flat again. Thank you, Bex. Um, Tom would like to know, he says he has a cartoon cell that has been kept in a tube for a long time. Who would you recommend he take it to for unrolling and proper framing? So a good frame shop should be able to do that for you and they should know what to do. And that's the kind of thing that they probably deal with very often. Thank you. And Elizabeth says that she has a very old, large prescription book from a pharmacy. Prescriptions are glued into the pages and the edges of the pages are crumbling and the spine is broken. How do I know if it's gone, too far gone to be repaired or can it be repaired? Good question. Um, there's too far gone and there's too expensive to repair, I guess. That's my, that's my real honest answer. Um, but without kind of knowing a little bit more about it and being able to see some pictures, I don't know if I can give you a great answer, but if you wanted to email me, um, I'd be happy to take a look and give you my opinion. And I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. That's wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Bex, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to go into this field? Absolutely. Um, so when I was in college, I came to really love using the library as a, as a resource and doing research. And that's what made me wanna go to library school. Um, and the thing that I found most fascinating was that 
in a in in a library there's just so much information and so many amazing books and even those rare and old precious books pretty much anyone can just go and ask to use and they will let, allow you to do that and I thought that was absolutely amazing and I want I knew I wanted to be a part of that and the idea of being able to um, there's this axiom that preservation is access and that by preserving books and providing access um, and if I could give someone else that feeling that I got as a student, I just, I loved that. And that's what I wanted to do. Fantastic. Good to know. Thank you. Um, one last question that I have here is what about line co tape? So line co makes a couple different kinds of tape, really any pressure sensitive tape though. Um, I would not call my friend. And Bex, thank you so much for giving your time tonight. We really appreciate your expertise and your knowledge a great evening. So thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Good to see you.